Welcome to the Krug Show, everybody. Larry Kruger, Ryan Smith, Dan Coach Emilio, the great Ned Coletti, former general manager of the Los Angeles Dodgers and uh, former assistant general manager of the Giants with us as we get it rolling for you. There we go. On a uh, on a Sunday, Giants are on a Saturday. Giants go. It feels like a Sunday, but Giants going for the sweep tomorrow because they win last night and they win again tonight. And uh, or today, tonight, kind of started in the day, finished in the evening. But guys, to me, I mean, the two, the relief pitching for San Francisco tonight was the difference. I thought uh, Harleen Garcia was outstanding in his re- inning of relief. Bags loaded, nobody out. He got out of it. Doval was outstanding in the eighth, and then Alvarez gives up the bomb to Fre- Freddie Freeman, uh, and still though finishes it out. And the Giants wind up using one, two, three, four, five six seven pitchers la u6 giants u7 uh the game only went nine innings but 13 combined pitchers and the giants get a 3-2 win and as i said tomorrow the the finale of the series Urias against rodan um good evening guys and and ned why don't we start with you i mean um terrific you know, start to this series for the Giants. I mean, they're um, they obviously have designs on winning this series and trying to jump back into the race. The Padres are hot. They got a doubleheader going. L.A. has been far and away the best team in the division. Um, so the Giants did what they needed to do last night. They got a big win. And tonight uh, they got a terrific pitching performance and still haven't thrown a shutout all year. But they got another win and and potentially um, get the sweep tomorrow. We'll see. What did you think of the game tonight? I, I thought it was an excellent game and a lot of opportunities. Both both sides had many opportunities. Uh, Dodgers had base runners every inning of the game, end up with two runs. Giants, uh, Caselli had a couple different chances there with the bunt, would have been a difference maker right there. And then the, the last at bat, but so many different opportunities. Giants relief pitching was superb when they needed to be. Big, great, great pitches. When I go back to that seventh inning, you know, I, I go back to 97 and Rod Beck. Yeah, getting, bags loaded, nobody out that yeah, day game in September. Yes, yes, and getting the double play to end it, you know. A lot of the same things kind of come flowing back, but really an excellent played game. Both teams have many chances. The, uh, Giants relief pitching, stellar. You don't win too many games when you get out hit 13 to 5. And uh, that's what happened today. Dodgers had 13 hits. Giants only wound up with five hits. Uh, but Estrada had a, had a home run. It's funny. I don't know. Tyro Estrada has been criticized for his defense. The Giants overall have struggled defensively. It was almost ironic that the game ended on a, on a slick play at second base by by Estrada. Um I don't. I mean, I'm not sure what to make of of Tyro. He's a pretty good offensive player. I, I've seen him make countless good, really, really sharp defensive plays. He makes that play going into the hole really, really well. Um, but he's kicked it around a little bit this year, and we saw him, you know, you know, uh, struggle in the field again today. He made another error. Well, you got to play. Uh, I'll start. I mean, you, you've got you've got to play really good defense when you play teams that are over 500 and teams that have a, a lineup like LA has. Um, so you know they got away with it a little bit there, but you know it made the game different when you when you have a a three or four run lead. You know you can you can have a little bit of play to it, but the way that game was going, that that play at second base was a, a key play, and it gave the Dodgers a little bit more life to try and come back, but then the bullpen, as we just said, was, was really key. But you've got to be able to pick the ball up. you got to do two things in order to win. You've got to be able to pitch, and you got to be able to play defense. Danny, uh, Rye, what would you guys think? I mean, it seems like that's been kind of the bugaboo for the Giants this year. They were so good in all phases last year. They had to be, right? They won 107 games. But we've seen kind of some uh, significant regression from the Giants defensively this year, and that seems like it's been a key a key theme for the Giants in the early going. What would you guys think of the win? Yeah, well, I thought, you know, it seems like baseball has a lot of things that happen in bunches. You know, guys get hot, they stay hot. Guys go into a slump. They're in a slump. You know, Betts was on a roll most of the year, and then he's been recently struggling. And you saw it today. He struck out with bases loaded. A couple other times he had chances. Estrada, he has had no errors. He had one error all year, and he's had three in the last three games. So it's just kind of fluky things. It kind of comes in bunches. But he came through at the end of the game with a stellar play on Bellinger's 
hit in the hole there. I, it was wow. I thought that was a tie ball game all of a sudden off the bat, but uh, Strada got over there and, and on his knees, kind of threw a strike to Ruff. So it was a really good game pitching wise. I thought the key was when Garcia was able to strike out Freeman on which was ball four, and then uh, the double play, uh, getting Trey Turner to a the probably the one of the top three fastest guys in all of baseball to get into a double play was amazing because that was, you know, that was it right there. And then I have a question for Ned because my understanding of, I kept thinking they were talking about that Crawford play over and over for, they went on for a, a half inning talking about the hit. Is that supposed to be a dead ball if he swings and it hits him? Because uh, to me, it was like, well, so didn't matter if it hit him or not. It got away. So I'm assuming it must be dead if because he swung. Is that what the rule is? Well, when, when he swings, it's a strike, no matter right. what happens after right. that. Right, but it still got away, so the right. runners would have advanced anyway, right? Right, correct. So and why that, would that's they... probably why they held it up. That's probably why it stayed. Yeah, but, so I don't understand why the uh, the guys on TV, Pruszynski and Karos and the uh, – lead announcer they talked about it like it was a game changer i thought to me it's like if it hit him he walks bases loaded he's run if he's if he if it, if he swung runners moved up advance it, nothing changed the run still scored yes. so i don't know what yes. they're they were acting like the the run shouldn't have scored and I, I just didn't understand that yeah i don't know if they were looking for a conversation or what they were doing but you know it's you know the, the play has as um, steps to it and and the steps were clear he swung and missed. Ball got away. Yeah, that's really the end of the story. And they and they went on for oh, at yeah. least fifteen minutes talking about it. Well, sometimes you get in. The, you know, Larry's probably had it on his radio, and I had it on TV. Sometimes you gotta you gotta talk. Just keep talking. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so guys exactly. like us can have something to talk about later. You know? Yeah, exactly. Uh, Ryan, you got a thought on the game? Uh, you could get some sun today, Ryan. I got a little sun today, too. I got the little raccoon look. I was out on the uh, baseball diamond watching both my boys play today. Nice. So I got the sunglass look. Uh, what did you think of the game, Ryan? Uh, well, first, uh, yeah, I, I had had to comment on my tomato face. Uh, so I might, I'm, you know, at my dad's apartment. So he's out of town. This is the first time I've been here where, you know, the heat's really rolled in. And it, it hasn't, you know, there, the fact that he hasn't fixed his air conditioning has not been a problem <laughs> today. Oh my God. Like I can't even breathe in here this morning. I, I literally, I got up at like 6am because it was so hot. And I, as you know, my girlfriend came up to visit, neither of us could sleep. Like I was on the, on the bathroom tile with, with, with Ringo, my dog and, and my girlfriend. And then, so today uh, my mom lives over in Moraga country club. So we decided, you know what, let's just go get in the pool. And no sunscreen, <laughs> so, oh. it, man. Uh, oh, there so you go. Fire. But anyway, uh, on to Estrada. Yeah, man. I mean, Estrada. I just felt weirdly. I feel like I can I can trust him offensively. Like he just since the beginning of the year, he's just made. It seems like he he gets these really key hits and key games. Um, and then yeah, I, I just. I mean, I don't. I, I guess for defensively, it's not that he doesn't have the ability or the tools, because like you said, like he's made amazing plays. It's just a matter of consistency. And I mean, Ned, this would be you know a question. I, I guess maybe for you is like, um, have you ever ha had the experience with these defensive players that you know sometimes can make unbelievable plays that you know no, not many people in the game can make, but they're not consistent and they make they screw up, and it's like. Well, I'd probably rather take the slower, less rangy guy who just is consistent. I know I can count on, you know, day to day to repeat. Well, there, there's a lot of different factors. You bring up a good point. And, and uh, by the way, there, uh, Todd K., thanks for the, the shout out there. The, um, sometimes you get in a situation where you need the offense of a player. And so you'll kind of live with defense. And then, as you say, you know, he can make he makes some excellent plays. So you got that in mind, too. But you also know once in a while, you know, there's going to be something that you're going to, you know, kind of shake your head at. And it's it's part of the deal. It's part of the give and the take of, of how you build your team, how you build your lineup. And, and when you look at, at this team with with belt out and you look at, you know, Bart, we've talked about off and on. Now he's back, you know, in the minor leagues trying to figure out offensively. 
you know, they they've got guys that grind out at bats. They know have, have good at bats. They can they can put together innings. So you'll take that with some spectacular defense and a little bit of shaky defense because you know you've got to have the, you got to have the other option. You've got a, a different option that is better than he is. And as much as we get frustrated by managers or head coaches or, or players, uh, unless you've got a decidedly better option, that's who you play. That's who that's who leads you. Uh, today was uh, Sons of Johnny LeMaster donate four ninety nine. Said Ned is a forever giant. Then they Johnny uh, Sons of Johnny say we need to be aggressive and get a catcher via trade. Uh, your thoughts? Well, we we've talked a lot about Joey Bart, as you know, Ned and Bart obviously got sent out. The Giants made a trade for Austin Wins, who actually had a pretty nice debut. He had a double, a couple hits, threw out a runner, uh, looked pretty good. Um, so I will get into the catcher situation as we go here, but I want to get your thoughts on on Clayton Kershaw because I thought, I thought maybe one of the underrated aspects to this win for the Giants was their working of Kershaw in the first two innings. This was Kershaw's first appearance since like the first week of May, and the Giants worked him through the first two innings for 42 pitches. And to me, if there was something that is kind of the sleeper variable of the win today, was was that right there? Just the fact that they worked him in those first couple innings, and they got into LA's bullpen. It's a you know they got a lot of talent down there in the bullpen, but um, you know if you if the bullpen's got to cover twelve outs or more as opposed to you know six outs, it's a totally different deal. I just I thought that was a that was a great sign for the Giants that they could work Kershaw. But you hadn't seen Kershaw in about a month. What'd you think of him? Well, um, sons of Giant Lamash, hey, thank you there, and uh, proud to. Proud to be forever there. Uh, excellent, excellent time. But let me get to Clayton here for Larry. The, um, you know, he he had a 31 pitch second inning, which for him is is a lot. And if you if you go back to those first couple innings, and the, and the broadcasters I think did did allude to this a little bit, uh, Eric and, and AJ. Uh, he had a couple calls that typically he gets that change the count. Couple one on one pitches went two and one. Everything changes. Two and one versus one and two, drastically different. But the Giants had a good approach to it. They made him throw strikes right out of the gate. And I think that, you know, you're right. Both these teams have that ability. And both of these teams, you see them grind out at bats because you're right. You start getting in the bullpen in the fifth inning, you know, you're going to get kind of, you know, you're, you're maybe your 11th, 12th, 13th pitcher at that point in the game. And Dodgers have been in a streak with, without an off day for a long period of time. So that bullpen has had a lot of wear and tear. Smart approach by the Giants. And, uh, you know, the Dodgers right now, a little bit in a tough spot with Walker Bueller going on the IL. Clayton just coming back in that 65-70 pitch range was, was his, his tolerance for today. So uh, you know, it was that, again, you, know, you got to have that approach. But the win for the Giants was huge. It would be four and a half back and not six and a half back. And then you win two in a row, and you got a chance tomorrow with really a good matchup going on. That was that was key, but you got to have that type of approach. Yeah, Kershaw by the his Kershaw's final line: four innings, three hits, the two runs, two walks, four strikeouts. But they worked him for seventy-one pitches in those four innings, and as we said, a lot of it in the first couple innings. So, Ned, give us your quick thought on just LA's rotation. So they got Kershaw back. We know Anderson has been absolutely a lifesaver, but the Dodgers also put Walker Buehler on the fifteen-day injured list today with a right forearm strain. Um, you know, I guess he had, uh, went under underwent an MRI yesterday um, or today, I should say, and um, and he had discomfort in the right elbow Friday night in the in the seven two loss. How concerning if, um, is that to you? I mean, he's a young pitcher. Uh, he's, he's, he's one of the best pitchers in baseball. Let's be honest here. Uh, but anytime you hear, hear elbow, man, that always makes me makes me concerned. Yeah, and he's you know, had TJ earlier too in his career. Yeah, yeah well, where, how, where, how concerned are you with Bueller's elbow? Well, I, you know, he's he's such a competitive kid. I mean, you know, for Giant fans, you know, you watch the the, the Madison Bumgarner years where the compete was off the chart. Walker Bueller's the same kind of compete. So when he's got an issue like that, you know, it's it's not just you know a way to get out of a start or a way to take a a short break on the IL. It's got to be real. 
And I think that, you know, he is such a, he was a, a Cy Young candidate till probably Labor Day a year ago, uh, competes, big game pitcher. So that, if he's going to spend some time on the IL, that is a tough, tough one for the Dodgers. When you look at how Anders has pitched, he's been great. Tony Gonsolin from St. Mary's, he's been great. But you're talking about two guys that really haven't thrown a lot of innings last year either. You've got kind of an interesting dynamic right now. He's got Walker Bueller not feeling right. You got Julio Urias, great 20 game winner a year ago. He threw more than he's ever thrown by a large margin. Does this year see, do you see an effect to it? You see the wear and tear a little bit. You see a lack of Christmas to the pitches and two of their better guys, Anderson and Gonsolin haven't really thrown that many innings by comparison to where Walker was a year ago or Julio was a year ago. So, uh, it's going to be an interesting dynamic. They've got some pitching in the minor leagues, but Ryan Pepio uh, lacks command right now. Like a lot of young pitchers, got great stuff, but really the command hasn't been great. Bobby Muller, another guy that can get it up in the high 90s, 100 miles an hour. It's been so so at Double A. So how they get through this next stretch of time is going to be very interesting. That's another reason why this was a huge win for the Giants because when you got a chance to take advantage and you know you got a chance now to sweep. That is a difference maker for your season, perhaps. Goes the other way, you know, you're not talking about acquiring a catcher. You're not talking about acquiring anybody at that point. But uh, you know, huge win. Yeah, you know, Ned, last night uh, you mentioned Walker Bueller's competitiveness, and I was listening to the broadcast with Crook and Kipe, and and Kipe mentioned Bueller looks hurt out there. He, w- he looked into the dugout. He winced a little bit, walked off the mound. And Kuiper kept saying, I think he's hurt. Something's not right. And they left him in there. Isn't that the manager or the pitching coach's job to protect the athlete who's going to compete? They should have walked out there and say, hey, what's going on? And instead, they just let him finish the inning. And now, you know, it might be something more serious. Yeah, well, I don't know if, if finishing the inning is going to make the diagnosis any different than it may have gonna, that it's going to be anyway. I think that, you know... They've got, you know, they keep tabs on everything. Everybody keeps tabs on, on so many different things. You know, if they knew that he had an issue uh, going in, which he's, he said that he, he hasn't felt right for a while, you look at really his last few games, it's, it's unlike him to give up the amount of runs he'd been given up in his last six or seven starts. So, you know, they're going to be careful with him, but they may have had the thought process too that, you know, as, as long as he can tolerate it, mm. we'll let him go. And he got close to, you know, finishing up an inning. So they maybe thought, hey, if he can tolerate it and get through this inning, we'll, we'll do something at that point in time. I mean, we'll see. If something snaps at the, at the like I can remember Jesse Fopper threw for the Giants, threw one pitch and boom, you know, there it was. Um, yeah. You know, I don't I don't know if that was what really happened in the last few pitches that he threw after after the wins. Yeah, you know, one, one other thing I'd just like to point out to, uh, we were talking a little bit about, fielding funks and guys that you know get into a funk and you'd rather have the keep the guy in the lineup or whatever i just want to point out something in in the 80s and this is a sad story that i read today uh steve Sachs had a real problem throwing the ball to first base and it, it got to be you know in his head and it, every ground ball he would just simple throw he couldn't make the throw but besides i brought that up because something i, I would like to you know, share my condolences to Steve Sachs and his family. Uh, tragically, his son, who was a uh, pilot in the Marines, uh, died this week. And uh, our thoughts and prayers go out to Steve Sachs and uh, his family. He It was his 33-year-old son who, yeah. I guess, had always dreamed of being a pilot. And um, Sachs's son was among five U.S. Marines who were killed during a training flight crash earlier this week in the uh, in the desert out, out here in California. Captain John J. Sachs, he was among the, the air crew of the Osprey uh, Till Rotor aircraft that went down during a training in a remote area in Imperial County, about 115 miles east of San Diego, they say about 50 miles um, from Yuma, Arizona. And I mean, just, you know, obviously Sachs, uh, he's a, he's a, he's a NorCal guy, Sacramento guy, um, and was a great Dodger second baseman, great speedster, leadoff hitter, rookie of the year, I believe. 
Um, you know, I mean, what the words can't speak of it. I mean, I, I'm a father. Ned's a father. Ryan someday will probably be a father. Danny, I'm not sure if you're a father or not, but uh, six kids and oh, six four, kids. Okay, so you're five, a father. Five grandchildren. <laughs> yeah, so you're a father. Your grandfather. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, it's the unthinkable, right? It's like there's there's sports, what we're talking about, the toy department of life, and then there's life, real life, and um, that's just that's just tragic. And um, there's nothing more you can really say other than you know, you just uh, you know, I don't know how I'd go on, and and uh, it's just uh, it's an unthinkable tragedy for for the Dodger family, and obviously for Sachs and his individual family. Did, did you know in all those years uh, being involved in with the Giants, or you know, as Sachs is an OrCal guy, or with the Dodgers, was there ever any reunions? You ever meet Steve Sachs along the way, Ned? Oh, many many times. Yeah, he was yeah, part of the broadcast. Many some times. radio together um, on their their flagship station, especially during the postseason. Um, you know, play with great intensity. Uh, really, a you know a guy that I, I really enjoyed being around. And uh, you know, he was playing you know for the team that, that you know I was trying to beat when he was a player. And um, but we had you know we had a lot of different things in common. And and um, it just you know it's we, we can we can all have massive vocabularies. We don't we don't have the words to to really explain it or. Yeah. You know, as we make the awkward transition back to this game, um, you know, from your perspective, you know, there's a lot of games, 162 games. You win some, you lose some. And, you know, some some people say, hey, with baseball, you're going to win your 50. You're going to lose your 50. It's what you do with those other 62 that determine what kind of season you're going to have. But if you're Dave Roberts or if you're Andrew Friedman, if you're, you know, grinding, and as you know, the, the, I don't know if the fans understand, but if you're a player, a coach, an executive with a team, man, it is a grind. And you're grinding every single day for a win, a win, a win. You're pushing, you're pushing, you're pushing. Is it, a game like this, is this one, you know, they're, like not every loss is equal. Um, is this an extra bitter loss because they did out hit the Giants 13-5? They did leave 14 guys on base. The Dodgers went two for 10 with runners in scoring position. I mean, they had their opportunities in the seventh. They had their opportunities in the eighth. It was there for the taking and they couldn't take it. Does this a game like this bother you more? Or is it the games where, you you know, you maybe lose connection with the team and it's kind of a one sided game? I mean, is this one? I mean, are they a loss is a loss? You turn the page or do you look at that one and go, man, we should have gotten that win. Well, kind of a loss is a loss and you, and you do turn the page. But I think that you not, not that you tolerate, but you, you expect some games that you should win that you're not going to win. But through the course of a year, you want to look back and almost count them all, be able to count them all off the top of your head. You don't want to get to the point where, where it becomes once a week or once every 10 days, you know, once in a while, it's going to happen. It's tough to play. It's tough to execute. It's tough to be great every day. The other team's playing too. The other team's getting paid as well. So, you know, it's, you, you, you know, it's going to happen from time to time, but when you do get to the end of the season and you got games like this, if you're the Dodgers, you like to be able to go back and, and count them off the top of your head without, you know, having so many, you lose track. So it is, I, I think it was, it, it's obviously a, a, a tough loss for the Dodgers. I think it's a bigger win for the Giants. Yeah. You're trailing, you, you've got to be able to beat the team, the teams ahead of you. And, and this was a, a huge game, especially because it was a bullpen game. You know, you had there, you had Clayton going who hasn't pitched for a while. So, you know, you're going to get that 65, 75 pitch count and try and get him out of the game with, with the, with the Giants did. But, you know, you got a bullpen game. And obviously, you know, they, they went through pretty much everybody in the bullpen. But when you have a bullpen game, to win a game against one of the teams you're chasing, that's a, that's a good thing for you. That's a good night for you. But you know what? you got to back it up tomorrow, too. Because if you get beat tomorrow and you're San Francisco, you're right back to where you were Friday night. So all the effort, all the, all the things you're able to do today, all the great clutch relief pitching, seventh, eighth, ninth inning, you know, you get beat tomorrow, you know, you're kind of back to where you were Friday. And if you're trailing, you don't ever want to be even or backwards. you got to continue to grind forward. Tomorrow's a huge game. 
for the job. No, no question. I know the, the boys want to jump in, but I, one more just as, as a follow-up to what you just said about the bullpen game. The Giants kind of chose to make this a bullpen game. This didn't have to be a bullpen game. They moved pitchers around and allowed this to be a bullpen game. I don't have the numbers in front of me, Ned, but my recollection of last year is that both the Giants and the Dodgers both had very good success on days where they went with a bullpen game. In fact, the Giants, who won 107 and won the division by one game, I think, like, liberally went bullpen games in September. I think there was a more than a handful, maybe five or six uh, times where they went, went with bullpen games because of the fatigue and the injuries and the numbers. Um it's funny when you say bullpen game to like people who follow the sport in the eighties and nineties and go further back seventies, a bullpen game was like, ah, uh, you know, like maybe we got a 30% chance to win. Now it almost is, 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 is as if teams look at the bullpen game as we can, we can kind of strategize a bunch of individual uh, advantages throughout as we stack our lineup. And I thought it was interesting. As soon as Kershaw came out, here's Yaz. Here are the left-handed hitters. Giants were ready to pounce once uh, Dodgers went to the righty. What's your, your feeling on bullpen games? Like when you were an executive, um, you know, and, and even when you're back with the Cubs in the eighties, as opposed to now where it seems like teams don't run from a bullpen game, they embrace it and they oftentimes succeed despite it. What do you think? Well, uh, I'm getting a little bit more comfortable with it um, for the reasons you point out. Uh, I am getting more comfortable with it. I can't tell you, I was a big fan of it early. Something I'm still not a big fan of is the opener. You know, that goes a hitter or two or three or whatever to, you know, uh, you know, if that happens, you know, back 10 years ago to 100 years ago, your starting pitcher gives you less than the, uh, the first inning or just the first inning. You know, you're upside down for a while. You're like you're, you're cringing for what's coming next in your next games. But I'm getting more comfortable with somebody going out there for two or three innings. And I think people are also your, your pitchers are more uh, used to it. I think when you when you didn't have that aspect of the the uh, the possibility of it and the planning of it and the strategy of it, you know, guys were upside down. Your pitching staff was like, "Oh goodness, what am I going to do?" But now guys are kind of in 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 the mode of it. They understand it. You know, no doubt the Giants bullpen knew what was going on today, and they they knew it for a while. Hey, we got to prepare to give us to get get outs. You know, you got to buy out, so to speak. And everybody that can get an out, that's why those double plays are huge, uh, or not turning them can be huge. Um, that's that's part of the deal. So a little bit more comfortable with it than I was at the outset. The opener, I still don't know about that one. <laughs> yeah, Go ahead, Danny and Rye, just want to jump in. I yeah. kind of expect oh. a transaction overnight with a, someone coming up to refresh the bullpen from Sacramento. And just a quick question, what do you think of what San Diego's doing with a six-man rotation? Well, I think I, I think that's where the game is going. I think the game is going to a, a bullpen game, uh, maybe every ten days, and I think it's going to a six-man rotation. You know, Danny, you and I are probably old enough to remember when there was a four-man rotation. Yeah, for sure. And so you know, and the, the Orioles have one of the great staffs of all time, uh, where they had four twenty-game winners. That's that was their pitching staff. Yeah, Including Pat Dobson, who was a great scout with, uh, with the Giants when I was there. Palmer, um, uh, McNally, Coyar, uh, and, and yeah. Dobson. I, I, complete you know, I, think it's, I think it's where the game is going. And if you got some quality, I think it helps. And I think also when you look at there's some pitchers that with the extra day's rest, they're much better. So when you've got that six-man rotation, everybody through that, that rotation is getting, quote, the extra day. And then you've got an off day you know, periodically through your season. Now you may get two days off. So all those things add up. I think it's smart. That team has played well. And you're thinking that they, they haven't even had Tatis yet. He's still probably a month away. But uh, A.J. Prell is in a nice job. He's had some ups and downs. Uh, and he's aggressive. I know people that, you know, that scout and run into the San Diego scouts and the San Diego people a lot. And, you know, they – they AJ's got a little bit of uh, of Brian Sabian's knack for he is always always looking to make that team better because he never sleeps he sleeps supposedly he sleeps three hours a night yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> three hours a night 
<laughs> that's by the, that's by I think by design. Most of us were thinking sleep, sleeping three hours a night, not by design, but by bullpen. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Rye. We've Keeping aced you up. out here. You want to jump oh, in? No, all good. I'll let you guys cook. Uh, so, okay, this one's kind of a bigger question for you, Ned. <clears throat> so we we batted this around earlier in the week, especially when. You know, I think that we were coming off a Warriors loss, possible Steph Curry in- ankle injury. We're about six and a half back of the Dodgers. Now things are looking a whole lot different. But what we kind of were saying is like, at this point, we, we we want like a mission statement almost from Farhan. And it maybe doesn't have to be directly from his mouth, but we were kind of confused with like, wait, like, first of all, do you see this team like as a possible contender? Like, let us know that. It, are we are are we you know going to like kind of go it all in on this season because you think that we're that good or are we kind of you know we want to keep the culture good we want to keep winning but really the emphasis is on you know 2024 2025 when our prospects start coming up and whatnot because when you run down the the uh, the lineup you could say that you know oh you know we're kind of waiting till you know a couple of years for our young guys and whatnot but then you run down our lineup and it's like well, who even is indispensable on this team? Like, who is, like, guaranteed to be on that roster in two years? And really, the only ones I can think of are, like, Webb, uh, you know, Duvall, Duvall and, yeah. you know, maybe Bart. I, I don't know, maybe, maybe Bart. But everybody else is, you know, 30-plus and, you know, seems like kind of on the down end of their career or, you know, they're kind of a journeyman type. So. That, 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 I think that was kind of what was frustrating us a little bit is it's just like we didn't ha- – I don't feel like we have a good sense on like what it is we're trying to accomplish here during this season. So that was, wasn't really a question, but like have you ever kind of found yourself, you know, in that point where it almost feels like you're, you're caught in between, you know, rebuilding and competing and, and, and how, how would you go about doing that if you were far on? Well, Ryan, I love you, but you know what? This is what separates uh, somebody that does it for a living like a Farhan. And, and somebody who's passionate about it, like, like a Ryan Smith, you know. Um, GMs have to be patient. You got to be patient and you got to le- let things play out. There is no way that on the, on the 11th of June, anybody's going to have enough of a, a feel with a team that's four and a half back to say, well, you know, we're not, we're not good enough. Well, let's go you know, unload some prospects and let's keep going. I don't think people, I don't think you can do it yet. I think you've got to really be patient with it and see how it plays out. There's steps to all of this. And the beauty of baseball and the curse of baseball a little bit is that you do it every day. You evaluate it every day. This isn't a once a week sport where you've got six or seven days to mull things over. Six or seven days, you're going to be playing six or seven games. You've got to be patient with it. I think when you get to another month from now, yeah, then then you then you kind of you you focus it a little bit different and you measure everything a little bit different. And then I think your your question then becomes if you're still sitting four and a half, five out, but you're in third place, then your question becomes like it like it hit the Chicago White Sox in nineteen ninety seven and the Giants were the beneficiary. They were three games out. They trade a the closer. They trade a, a swing man, Danny Darwin, and a starting pitcher, Wilson Alvarez, to the Giants for prospects, really. And Ron Shula's way of saying it was, yeah, we might catch Cleveland, but we're not going to get past the first round. So you, you then take it another step and you say, okay, you know, how much are we going to pay to maybe get in? Are we going to beat the Dodgers? Are we going to beat the Padres? You know what? I don't see them falling back. So, yeah, we may get in because of the expanded postseason. But do we have a chance to make an October run? Yeah. Because that's that's what you try to do. You know, if this franchise hadn't been to the postseason in 20 years, if you're the Pittsburgh Pirates back, you know, back a few years ago, and you got to get to the postseason because, you know, half the people that are 20 years old don't, don't even have recollection of you being in the postseason. Then, then, yeah, you go a little bit stronger, a little bit, a little bit harder, maybe this time of year, but certainly in July. But you just won 107 games. You just went to the postseason. You got to measure realistically, just like you do with your prospects. Who is really a big league player in a major market that can compete against the best and win you games versus somebody that's a good minor league player that 
just going to be maybe the big league player, but they'll be playing in some organization that loses 100 games a year. You got to be honest with yourself on your prospects. You got to be honest with yourself on your team and figure out, okay, where are we really? And, and how do we, how do we really match up? And do we have a chance? Do we go after the Cubs catcher who we've talked about on the show a handful of times? Do we do that? You know, or do we say, you know what, it's going to cost us too much to do that. And it may get us to the postseason. Is it going to get us passed around? Do we have enough pitching? Is our bullpen healthy enough? Do we have enough stamina? Is everybody okay? Because let's face it, last year, last year wore out two excellent teams. And yeah, they both chase. played today in San Francisco. Both both teams took it to the other one so hard that they, they were still trying to recover. Maybe Walker Bueller is still feeling the effects of that. You know, maybe no. Julio but, yeah, I mean, we know Scherzer is right. I mean, oh, it was, see, it was yeah. I mean, Buster Posey even talked about pretty much. You know, he knew this was going to be his last year. He put, he gave everything that he had left in the tank last year. And I look around at guys like Crawford, and that gets gets me thinking. Like, you know, I don't know. Did we? You know, I mean, he, he is an older guy, thirty four years old, and we emptied the clip. You know, it, it's it's. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, and then going back to the the bullpen game thing, I think the other thing that kind of prompted it is we were talking, you know, of course, we're talking Judge Soto, that cult, kind of, you know, pie in the sky stuff. But I think we were kind of ended up switching to where it was like, well, I mean, we'd rather have these homegrown guys that co- start coming up, but we don't really, you know, we have a few guys, Lucian, it, it identified in the farm system, but none of these guys are guaranteed to hit. So we were almost talking like, oh, it would be nice to have a few more, you know, lottery tickets, uh, you know, in there as opposed to maybe, tra- you know, trading some of that for a 34 year old somebody, you know, that could help us down the stretch. But, well, I we talked they- about Joey Bart early in the season. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, I think, you know, at least one guy in the show was really enthusiastic about Joey Bart. Right? <laughs> I mean, like, and I kept saying, you know, hey, you know, a week, a week don't matter. You know, th- this is a long, this is a, it's not a baseball week or a baseball month. It's a baseball season. And yeah. we've seen how tough it is, to your point, Ryan. You know, there's – look, there's there's not enough pitching in the game to begin with. So what do you think the minor leagues have? They don't have it either. So a guy that might be tearing it up at double A AA or triple A, he ain't pitching against those guys in the show. He ain't hitting against those guys in the show. So yeah, let's, and, let's and I think the uh, Giants – I was just going to say about their pitching, getting back to what you were saying, Ned, the the – the future going to a six man rotation. I really think the giants are in good position going forward because they have seven starters. Now, granted three of them are on the shelf in Junis who just went on the IL and um, Cobb is out and D Scalfani, but they've got seven guys so they can run a six man rotation. When you got Junis, when he comes back, Webb, Wood, D Scalfani, he'll be back shortly. Rodon, who goes tomorrow, Alex Cobb, and then they got Matthew Boyd, who would pitch well with the Tigers. He's due to come back sometime the end of this month. So there's Farhan ran out of pitching last year because he he said he wanted to get one more arm for the stretch. So I think what he did this year was really bright. He went out and signed Matthew Boyd in the offseason, who he knew wasn't going to be ready until sometime in the middle of the season, it's like a trade in a way that you made already. And so they've got him coming. I think with a, with guys like Rodon who tires out every year going to that six man rotation and getting guys to go five or six can really lighten the load on a bullpen and have you ready for October. I I think it's the way you play it. And, and hope, you know, for the Giants, you know, if they can get those guys back, I think that's what you'll see. I don't think you'll see a, a, a strict five man rotation, mm-hmm. maybe once through, but you're going to, you're going to see guys that are, are a little bit more rested and you give you the extra day or two. Cause think about it. I mean, you just named three guys that are all hurt already right now. Right. So it, it's not like you're dealing with, with the Mike Mucinas or the Greg Maddox from another era that, you know, we're going to go out there day, you know, start at the start at the start at the start for year after year after year. Got my guys that have got some wear and tear to them and are, are, are vulnerable because they're already, they're already hurt. They're hurt today. 
So I think that you will see exactly how you set it up. I think that's where the game's going. And you may yeah. see a six-man rotation with a bullpen game thrown in there too. Well, and, and not only that, I mean, um, I mean, if you ask me, you can you can either ha- you can go for the top tier guys, like you know, the, the in the top free agent guys, and spend a lot of money, or and have five guys, or you can not take any of those top tier guys and just get. But now you have ten guys, and they're more made up of you know guys on minor league deals and guys that are you know potential uh, step forward guys this year. I'll go with the ten deep every single time because I just think that you you know the game the schedule is relentless. There's another game tomorrow to the next day and you need innings. And if you run out of innings, then what? And if you have options in your, you know, minor league options and a back end of your road of your roster options and flexibility, I think that's that's the route I would go. Um, we were talking about catchers. I, I got to ask you because, you know, I'm, working, I'm watching the broadcast. And every time I watch A.J. Pierzynski, I think of A.J. Pierzynski with the Giants. So let's let's go back to 2004, right? Wasn't it 2004 that you guys acquired him? I think so. And um, I don't know. I mean, at the time, I loved the deal. I thought it was a phenomenal deal. Joe Nathan um, was good, really good, but had a terrific arm. But, you know, uh, catchers are at a premium. And this was a young catcher who could really hit. Um, and you guys made a trade, Booth Bonzer and Francisco Liriano and Nathan to Minnesota. And you got Pierzynski in the midst of his arbitration years. Um, and then... There was a, you know, he didn't fit in real well. I, I can tell you right now, I can remember being in those clubhouses. He, he, uh, Matt Herges didn't like him. Brett Tomko didn't like him. Uh, there were probably other guys who were less obvious about it. Uh, AJ, you know, was pretty outspoken. You know, I liked him because I always felt like, you know, he, he's kind of a smart ass and I, I could, uh, I could understand that. I could understand that. You um, could relate, huh? I could relate. I could relate. <laughs> but I, I kind of liked him outside of he hit the ball hard and he hit the ball on the ground and he wasn't the fastest guy. So he hit into a lot of double plays. But he did sting the ball pretty good and he got, uh, he didn't get off to a great start. And I know you guys didn't necessarily like the way I remember talking to you in spring training and I said, hey, Ned, what do you think of AJ? And I remember you telling me, you know what? We're not overly impressed with his presentation. And I was trying to press you for information. What do you mean? What do you mean? And you wouldn't necessarily give it away. Um, Then you guys non-tendered him at the end of the year and watched him go to the White Sox and you didn't get anything for him. And then he goes and catches a terrific year in Chicago and they win it all. And I'm just kind of wondering what that two-year, how you and Brian felt about that two-year run, both the effort to acquire him from, uh, from was it McPhail and those guys in Minnesota, and then what he was for you, and then the decision to non-tender him, and then to watch him have this incredible success the next year. Was there points in 05 that you guys were like, man, we really should have held on to this guy? I mean, Talk, talk a little bit about your brush with Pierzynski and, and, and from your perspective, how it went. Well, that, that's a lot right there. <laughs> <laughs> I got, I got all sorts of things I can, I can, I can get to here. Um, I, and if I, you want to bring up Stan Conti, you can, I mean, I mean, you know, I mean, what, whatever direction you want to take it. The, um, <laughs> it, it's almost reminiscent of, where the Giants were in the winter of 03 04 that led to that deal is almost where the Giants are at today. Okay. In that in that particular position. They won hundred games in 03. So you've got again, you have a position. We've said it on the show before. You you can't fake that position. You might have a, a shortstop, you know, a third base and play shortstop for a day or, or whatever. You know, a first base and play the outfield, outfield to play first base. But, you know, the catcher's to catch. There's only so many of them around. So you can't fake it. And and we we liked the player a lot. It wasn't a good mix for him. It wasn't, it, it wasn't a comfortable environment for him. And, you know, people, it was just, it was upside down almost from the get-go. I can remember sitting in Saves' office. We were sitting there late at night going through the team, maybe in May or something like that. And out in the hall, who he lived right near the stadium, was AJ walking with his dog. Just, I mean, he was feeling it too. And I think he came in the office that night. This man, you know, it's going way back. And you know, and we just kind of talked it through. 
But, you know, the game is relentless in so many different ways, including when you struggle. Because when you struggle, you don't have the week off to, to readjust, to reset. You got to figure it out the next day. He's a starting catcher. So as the struggle started, there was no way to really stop it. And, and it was tough. I mean, he felt it. it you know, he, you know we've, he and I have talked about it off and on. You know, we, we don't see each other that much. Uh, I saw him in, in October last year. I had, I had the, one of the great honors of my career to be inducted into the Chicago Sports Hall of Fame, my hometown. And really the criteria is based on two things. One is you grew up there and you have a decent pro, you know, pro career or major college career, uh, or you win a championship there. And so he and I were inducted the same evening, I think back to back. And we talked before we got to that moment you know, about a bunch of different things, including a little bit of that year and just how upside down it was for him, how it was for the club. Obviously, we gave up a really good starting pitcher in Liriano, who we knew could could be that. But again, we're trying to get a starting catcher. Um, and, and Joe Nathan, you know, we liked Joe. He was a shortstop, a converted player who I think had sat out a year before that, wasn't sure if he wanted to continue in baseball or not. So, you know, you know, we... We weren't going to hold the deal up for somebody who had had the record of, of Joe at that point in time. Ends up, I think, saving over 300 games. So, you know, if you're going to grade the deal, you're not you're going to obviously not give give you know our, our front office a lot of high marks for it, especially because of what happens a year later. But sometimes that happens, and I think the I think the lesson to it is, um, I think the lesson to it is in whatever you're doing, whatever part of life you're in business, personal, whatever it is, is you, you never want to put yourself in a situation where you're quote desperate, where you have no choice, but to do this. And our catching was, was so thin. We had a chance to get a guy that was really a young player, as you say, in his arbitration era. And, and unfortunately we had to do a case before he ever played a game for us. So you had that upside down feeling too, you know, and was that acrimonious? Uh, if you well, remember, yeah, it, it wasn't it wasn't pleasant. It wasn't pleasant for anybody, you know. And we had we had no comparables. I don't want to get into the arbitration process, but the arbitration process is really based on comparable players. And to decide on his salary just in a negotiation, we had a tough time with it, and we had a tough time in the case because we really had no comparables that we could we could pin it down. When you do arbitration stuff, you're going to find players in the same position, relative same position that are making uh, X number of dollars a year and their careers uh, kind of mirror the player you're talking about. And where does that player fit? That's the process. That That's a very short explanation of a very detailed process. But we had no comparables. So we were kind of all over the board. He was kind of all over the board. He ends up winning the case. But it set the whole tone for something that, that was, wasn't good for anybody. And, you know, he didn't want to, he didn't want to leave San Francisco. And when he got there, he was excited to be there. He didn't want the year to go the way the year went either. And you know, it's just, it's going to happen from time to time, but that's, that's the deal. And I almost signed him in LA too. I think I may have told you that story on the air or someplace that, you know, he was about to sign with the Dodgers. And um, so, you know, my relationship with him, even though we had that upside down year, I, I still knew he could play right. And he could help. And this is after the 05 championship, but uh, he lives in Orlando, Florida at this period of time, maybe still does and was going to a basketball game to see the magic play the bulls and who happened to be there, but Jerry Reinsdorf, the owner of the bulls, who was also the owner of the Sox, where he had just got done playing. And they had a conversation and Jerry says, what are you up to? He says, I'm about to sign with the Dodgers. And, and he says, no, you're not, you know, well, you know, what do you need? And, and right. he, he just won the world series here. Yeah, I'll, I'll do this. You know, I'll do this. What, what do you need? I, well, I need this. You got it. And he called me the next day. He says, I'm sorry. He says, you know, I went to the game thinking I'm going to be a Dodger. And then I run into the owner of the White Sox. And, you know, I'm going to go back there. So, you know, that, that that's not the gist of the story. It's it's just that sometimes things go upside down. And and, that, and that's what happened. But really, the, the crux of the story is never put yourself in a position, if you can help it, where you don't have another choice where you don't have young catchers coming or you don't have uh, more, more players that you could sign on the market that, you know, that we're going to, you know, fit into our payroll type of thing. You don't ever want to get in that spot. And, but it, it's hard not to. 
Because yeah, think you, about the organization too. We're talking about coming off many, many good years, right? And the new ballpark was still. You guys had gone to the World Series in 2002. Yeah. You had been in the playoffs in 2000. You won 100 games in 2003. Yeah. There was a lot of momentum there. Yeah, so we had to keep the expectation and the momentum going too. And you know, we all know, you know, you, you can't fool the game. The season's too long to fool the game. And if you don't have a big league catcher that can go out there and, and catch 120 games, or at least have two guys that can catch 81 and 81, you know, you're, you're going to have a tough year. It's just, it's just the way it goes. It's yeah. like a closer. You, you can't win without a closer. You can't win without a catcher. Yeah, catching is important. And I'm noticing a lot of teams are starting to load up with catchers in their minor league system. For example, Bleacher Report recently put out their top 100 and the Oakland A's have two catchers at number 33 is uh, Tyler Soderstrom, who was drafted just a couple years ago. From Turlock. And, He's a yeah. Lions Bay Area guy or North yeah. guy. And at uh, uh, 30 is Shea uh, Langoliers, I believe it is. So they got two of the top 33 prospects in all of baseball, and they're both catchers. Uh, we had talked about, well, maybe – Bart, they can make a deal for Bart for Sean Murphy or something of uh, of that lines. But if they've got two young guys coming up, they're probably not interested in getting someone else. But catching, as you mentioned, is is so important. You know, we look. We talked just about AJ. He had a pretty good career. If you looked at the catching position, you could almost argue that he's got borderline hall of fame numbers he he had 280 with over 2,000 hits for his career which is pretty significant for a catcher i don't think he's a hall of famer but he's he's borderline we sold that play in the world series too that uh you know i wasn't i forget the play but remember there was a key play in that world series that i remember him selling it and and the white Sox got the call the white Sox, i think swept the astros that year in the world series yeah. that was one of the great pitching staffs Long i think i've seen it Juan Uribe, big player for the Sox. Yeah, yeah. And they can, they had Contreras. They had uh, uh, they. Well, I mean, they had they they were loaded. They were really really stacked. Um, Ned, well, first of all, Jaguayo fifty six donates five dollars. Says Krug, our focus is always on the Dodgers. Are we overlooking the Padres? I think the loss of Max Scherzer left I'm a gaping hole in their rotation. He was tough. What do you think, Ned? I mean, uh, it's the Padres. The is it possible the Padres may be the most talented team in the NL West? I think, I think so. if they can stay healthy, I think they're right on. And I never overlooked the Padres. We just talked about AJ a couple minutes ago and the job he's done. Um, they've done everything that they've done without their best player or at least their best hitter. And so they've got pitching. They've had pitching for a while. They've yep. developed a lot of their own. They've traded for some. They get healthy and that they can maintain what they've got. Um, you know, They're, they're going to be tough. If, if, if Walker Blue is going to be out for a while, that's that really takes a toll on the Dodgers in a lot of different ways. And I think that if San Diego can stay healthy, I think they may be the team that, that you're going to have to watch out for in the West. They, they yeah, and, and, the, and hiring Bob Melvin, when they did that in the oh, offseason, yeah. I was like, dang, yeah. that's too Solid good guy. of a move for the I Padres. I thought it was the biggest move in the West. Yeah, it was a solid I mean, move. Until maybe Freeman, but it was it was it was the move in the National League West for I think most of the winter. We're talking about catching. I think the Giants. This is what we need. <laughs> Have you guys? A uh, you, is that Buster? Yeah. Need a Buster. <laughs> Have you guys talked at all about Austin Wins yet? Um, I mean, of course, it's a super small sample size, but I mean, four hits, six abs. I mean, just Wins uh, is a winner. Yeah, I mean, it just seems unthinkable coming from the catcher spot for the Giants. Uh, I mean, I, you probably need to go 0-16 to get it down to what Bart's batting right now. Um, and now he hit DH today, which was, like, got pretty surprising. So, yeah, I don't know. What, what are your thoughts on him? Do you think – I mean, I just have no idea what to make of him. He's a career 200 hitter. and He was hitting he's... 365, though, this year in the minors. I mean, it is really. AAA, but this Bottom year... surfing, trying to catch lightning in a bottle for sure. It seems like yeah. – that's a theme, you know, and yeah. it's worked. Hey, let's, you know, we can sit there and kind of scoff at him, but then, you know what? Here comes a Yaz, and then there's a Tyro Estrada, and then there's, you know, uh, uh, Dominic Leone, 
and Luis you know, they, Gonzalez. and Jacob Junis. And you look around and you're like, well, wait a second. He Lamont hasn't necessarily hit on, he hasn't hit on his prospects, but as far as the bottom surfing trades that Farhan has, has made, he has been able to unearth, um, <clears throat> a few guys who are, who have been contributors, Ned. So, I mean, it's, you got to give them credit. They're relative. No names. They don't move the needle. The fans aren't necessarily all that impressed, but, uh, the giants are over 500 and last year they won one Oh seven. And a couple of these guys can actually play. So I can't really pan it and say, man, it's a terrible strategy. It seems to be working to some degree. No doubt. Uh, I think he's been excellent at it. And, um, you know, as far as uh, the catcher goes, you know, I'm going to I'm gonna wait a little longer than the six of bats. But, you know. <laughs> Give him more than six ABs. Call, you're not, you mean you're, you're, you're not ready to sign him to a ex- three-year extension, no, Ned? I'm, I'm not ready to call a bobblehead company to, to see if they can make one up. You know? <laughs> um, but, uh, That's what that, you sound like me with the day I, I saw Bobby Estelea hit a ball in Mesa over the center field screen in like an early Cactus League game against the Cubs. Yeah, and I remember going back, you know, the Saren, to the station going, man, Bobby Estelea, Bobby Estelea. And uh, well, needless to say, he didn't necessarily take off from there, but uh, oh, he did, hit, he, he did hit, hit an impressive shot in Mesa. Bart, the first game of the year, I think we were all like, well, yeah, he's got Rookie of the Year wrapped up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, exactly. Also, also, you guys touched on the crowd, though. Uh, I don't know if it was uh, the broadcast in particular, but they, Brzezinski said that he looks like over 50, over 50% blue. It was. So, it yeah. was definitely a blue. But it was fun. I mean, I looked it out at left fun. field, and it looked like there was one shot online. I saw it looked 80, 90% like the – Left field, center field was all like they bought the entire section. But uh, it's because you know, Giants fans like Dan sold their tickets to Dodger fans in number. They got and then pay, they just though. crowded. <laughs> That's what happened. They crowded the house. But it seems like on the Saturday, when the Giants and Dodgers get together, the Saturday game does seem to attract a ton of Dodger fans. And they come in number. I mean, it was, I would say, I mean, literally in, t- in today's game, Doval had to hold his, his, you know, whatever he was listening to on his wrist. He had to hold it up to his ear in his home yard because there were so many Dodger fans in attendance. I mean, that. That's uh, you know I felt like I was watching the Niners and the Rams again from the from uh, the yeah, football season. Yeah, I was actually thinking of that. I was because he's holding it up, he can't hear because the the things inside of his cap. They what they should do is make a Bluetooth and put a little earpiece, just a single thing in one ear, so you can actually hear it directly in the ear versus trying to listen to it from the cap that's not in the playoffs that's going to be impossible is it like a bone conductor thing like why is it up there i that was the only thing i could think of is like it it's some sort of vibration deal where but because otherwise yeah i mean it seems like you'd be better off wearing airpods for god's sake and i think it's in in spanish for guys like duval it's bilingual thing that you you can make it so yeah just they all they got to do is make it somehow bluetooth switch to an earpod and then he's not going to have to you know, in the playoffs, when you got screaming fans even more intense than today, there's no way you can hear. And that's going to slow down the game and all that. But, uh, yeah, I, I would just say this about me selling my tickets to the Dodger fans. If anybody bought my <laughs> tickets and if you're watching, read my shirt. Uh. <laughs> hey, Ned, I was, gonna... coming up, I was supposed to come up this weekend as of about a month ago. And um, I was coming up to take out a lot of my buddies with the Giants um, because I hadn't seen them for a while in, a, in kind of a social setting. And, uh, you know, I'm going to run them over to Sedini's for, for nice. a nice dinner. And then I tried to get flights. And then I tried to get hotel room. And it was like, wow. it was almost, I mean, it wasn't impossible, but it was like, I'm just flying an hour. You know, I'm staying overnight for one night. And it was like, whoa. Whoa, 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 you know, I got to pick another weekend. But you're right. The Saturday games up there, it's it's a it's an event. 
Yeah, absolutely. Todd K, by the way, donates four ninety nine. Says thanks for being on, Ned. You're amazing. Uh, we'll second that. We we agree, and we're glad that you're with us. Um, we're going short tonight because I've got my daughter is graduating from Davis. We got to get up at four o'clock in the morning <laughs> to go to the graduation. <laughs> uh, so you, normally I, I try to go to bed late and and sleep in late or somewhat late. Uh, there'll be none of that tomorrow. So I'll, we're going to cut this a little short. But I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you about the firing of Joe Madden and. And Joe Girardi, two guys that I know, you know, um, and I know you respect. And I just kind of wanted to get your thoughts on on their dismissals. And also, um, you know, just baseball managers. I mean, this is a you know, I, the one I think of is the Marlins, whatever year that was fired Jeff Torborg. Oh, and yeah. they did it in like first week in May and they brought in Jack McKeon and McKeon was in his 70s at that point and they went to the World Series with Jack McKeon so it is amazing watching you know you can't change all the players and so sometimes you get to a spot where you got to do something and so changing the manager sometimes is the most convenient thing Philly has responded by taking off and winning games Um, but I mean these are really good baseball men what's your thought on on Joe Madden and I mean you could make a, make an argument that you know five years ago Joe Madden was right there with Bruce Bochy as considered the best manager in the entire game and now be, you know Mike Sosha couldn't win with Artie Moreno down there I mean they couldn't get it done outside of of what we know O two and Joe Madden. Um, you know, struggled, and obviously Joe Madden's got on his resume. He won it, you know, on the north side, and ended that incredible drought. And he'll have that forever. But what do you make of Madden and Girardi being ousted? And and how have you ever had to fire a manager at any point or been with an organization? It's got to be a difficult thing to do in May or early June. No, no doubt. Um, you know, I can't. I've been part of it. I don't think I had to do it uh, as the person in charge. Um, it happened probably a couple times in my Cub days. Um, you know, we were we were not as uh, as good as uh, as they were under under Joe. Um, I think what you do is you you have to evaluate. Um, first of all, did you hire the manager? That that's a piece of it. And I think I don't know that that Perry or Dave hired Joe or Joe. I think they. I know that Philly was was you know was inherited. Uh, Joe Girardi, I've, I've known him since he was drafted. He was uh, out of Northwestern, uh, Cub pick uh, when I was there. So I've known him a long, almost hired him in L.A. Before I hired Joe Torre, it was going to be Joe Girardi. A uh, lot of, a ton of respect. He's, um, um, in that situation, if you sense that your players have have stopped playing hard, and I don't have any insight to either the Angels or the Phillies, that that was a thought process. If you, if you think that your players have stopped playing hard for your manager, you've got to make that move. And, and that's. And that, how do you get that indicate, not to interrupt you, but how well, do you get that indication? Is it talking or is it, is it, is it body language and what you're seeing? Your eyes tell you? you see it. It's how you're present. It's really your presentation a lot. And, you know, you mentioned the word presentation a, you know, a few minutes ago. The presentation tells you a lot about how it's going. And, Sometimes you need the fresh voice, and that's that happens all the time. Uh, you got two really good baseball managers that just lost their jobs. You know, uh, you know Madden's comments a little bit. You know, like a little bit tired of the analytical approach. I think from some of the things I read. Um, so maybe there was just a, you know a conflict with that. Um, but I think if your team doesn't play hard for the manager, I think you've got to look at change. And at the same time, if your team is is mediocre, but they're playing as hard as they can play and the presentation is as good as it can be, uh, and as, as you look around your team, and I do this all the time with teams I'm associated with, I, I do like a, like a one to ten scale in my head, okay? This player, I mean, he may be the 26-point player on the roster, or he may be, you know, trying to play the fourth line for San Jose. You know, are you getting nine or ten out of that player? Okay. Doesn't mean everybody's, you know, McDavid and hockey. Mm-hmm. No, no, no. It's like for what that player can bring you, are you getting eight and a half, nine, ten on a consistent basis? And if you are, and that's really how your team is constituted, and most of your players are up to that, then you know what? 
it's, it's not your head coach. It's not your manager. It just might be the level of talent you're at. You know, I look at the, at the Giants from last year. You know, I don't think anybody stopped playing for Gabe Kapler. I don't see him stopping. I think they're playing for Gabe Kapler right now, too. You know, it, it doesn't have, they mentioned on the broadcast, you know, they don't have the superstar lineup the Dodgers have. Look at that. Look, look at their lineup. But they play. They grind. They play. The effort is pure, and it's an honest effort. And as long as you got that, you're good. You're good. But when you start to see that waver a little bit, and, you know, you've got $230 million invested in the Philadelphia Phillies, and your team is nine or 10 games under, 11, 12 games behind the Mets who are running away from it, and you've got the Philly fans, which are as passionate as any in the sport, can't sit there for long if you start to see that your team is starting to wobble because of effort and because of attention to detail. Um, we're just going to go about five, five or 10 more minutes and then we'll call it a night. Uh, but guys, you want to jump in? I feel like I'm dominating this, by the way, Jonathan, thank you for the dollar dollar 99 donation. And you're seeing some people in the chat here that, um, Brian Roush is a new YouTube member. So, you know, there's a new level. If you'd like to be a, a member of the Krug show, you can actually sign up to be a member. There'll be special content that goes just to members. And Brian, we appreciate you being a member, but, uh, Danny and, and, uh, Ride, jump in if you got a couple couple thoughts before we say goodbye to Ned tonight. I, I've got some soft tissue, or so you know. Uh, I'm not necessarily going to blame Junis. You know that was kind of a freaky, you know, freaky thing. But there's been some comments made in the Giants organization about you know maybe players not being in the best shape. And um, I think on the Grant Cone 49er podcast we were actually talking about this, where you know a guy like Bill Belichick in football like if you pull if you're pulling your hamstring constantly and getting those kind of injuries like they don't have sympathy for you they're like that's you need to be you know stretching working with the trainers you need to be conditioned all of that kind of stuff uh have you ever really kind of dealt with a situation like that where you feel like and and how do you go about it when you know you're seeing guys going down to all these soft tissue injuries over and over and over again well, you, you've got to obviously keep your finger on the pulse of your entire organization, including your training staff, and have com- great communication with them. You know, I, I had Stan Conti both in San Francisco and L.A., and we probably talked every day, and, and most of the days in the wintertime, too. You've got to stay with it. And I think that um, – I think when you have injuries that nobody can help, that's one thing. Or if you have older players that are just starting to wear down, you, know, you have to take that in consideration, and I'm not I'm not addressing anything specific here with any team, uh, just in general. But I think as if you have a reoccurrence in in players that really uh, are in the prime of their career, and it's stuff that you know maybe they're not stretching enough, maybe they maybe they're not paying enough attention to their career. Um, you know, you you've got to you've got to evaluate that, and you know it's. It happens a lot where managers get blamed. We just talked about two of them for a team's performance uh, and lose their lose their their job at that point in time. And you know the trainers come under fire sometimes in different organizations. You've got to really examine it. And is it is it the players? Now again, I'm not speaking specific here to any club or any trainer or any player, but you have to just as a as a former GM, you have to look at okay. You know, this player needs to work harder. You know, a trainer's job is to prepare players and to do this. A trainer's job is maybe a little bit to, to pull a player out to the field and, and have them do their work. But when you think about it, if the player themselves don't have it to, to work as hard as they can and, and prolong their career and give their team a chance to win, you know, in my opinion, shame on them, you know. But some people lose their gigs because because that's what happens. Somebody else doesn't fulfill their obligation. And so somebody else that's that is viewed as in charge of somebody else's obligation takes the heat. But you know, you've got to you've got to know your staff. You've got to know everybody in your organization and know how they do their job, how they think. Like I've said before on this show, you know, people think you just scout players. No, you scout everybody. You scout you scout your owner. You scout. You have to know how everybody does what they do. You got to filter everybody because everybody's got to. Yeah. Everybody's coming from some direction, and you got to know where they're coming from. 
Yeah, and, and and I see Romo's got a question. Go ahead with that, Larry. And I have a follow up that actually yeah, Romo was just Romo two thousand one right donates five on bucks. He says, with your talk on Pierzynski, when trying to acquire a free agent, is there more interaction with the player himself or their agent? Is there a more preferable way? I think this is a great question, Ned, because I think I remember us talking about not just AJ in in uh, you know in specifics, but just free agents in general and how that. It's really a landmine, uh, you know, where you don't know what you're getting when you haven't drafted, developed, and brought that player along. You don't really know the personality, and it's a little bit of a gamble when you're rolling the dice and bringing guys in and just, you know, you can look at it and say, well, does the skill sets of our 25-man roster fit together? And there, and there, that's a whole another discussion. And then there's a whole separate discussion of, well, are the people in the room, because you've always had emphasize to me that most importantly it's the men in the room and do they blend and do they complement each other and is it a is it a comfortable mix is it a natural fit or is it constant headbutting so that's a great question when you're in the free agent discussion when you were doing it for the giants or the dodgers did you want to talk directly to the player did you want to talk did you want to stay away from the player and just deal strictly with the agent was it guy to guy case to case how did you view that mr romo as larry said tremendous question um I would always, always try and get with the player. Uh, you know, at the winter meetings, a lot of times the agents would bring their players and, and you'd have a chance to maybe have lunch or sit down and look somebody eye to eye. You can't always do it. And sometimes you have to be wary of that. Most of the time, you're going to talk to the agent far more than you're going to talk to the player. But it, it was important to try and talk to as many players as possible to make your decision. I mean, it's like a job interview in a way. And, you know, how many people, you know, that are around this, that are listening to this, uh, you know, have an interview for a job where you've had a talk or you've had a meet with the boss, right? I mean, it's like common stuff. So you try to do that. And sometimes you're, the agent prohibits you from doing it, which is a little bit of a red flag to it. And other times people come in and they just, uh, they they overwhelm you with their honesty and their ability to do it. I the guy I think of off the top of my head is Zach Renke. Zach Renke came in and sat with Don Mattingly and Stan Kasten and myself for over three hours with no agent. He just came in and wanted to know about us and was open to anything we needed to know about him. I thought it was phenomenal. Helped us sign him. You know, he ended up being a great signing for us, 51 and 15, and I think second in a Cy Young one year. But, you know, he was open. And anybody that I would find that would be open to letting us know how they think, who they are, how they process, how they sacrifice, helps you make a decision. But again, I, I go back to you know the, the negotiation out of desperation. Sometimes you don't have the opportunity. And sometimes it's the last player standing at a particular position that you think can handle a major market. And I've worked, I worked for three teams, all of them in major big time markets. So that was always a consideration, but you know, you can't put yourself in that desperate spot, but it, I would be wary of any agent who would not let me meet with a player, talk with a player, fly a player in, go visit a player, all these different things. And I think it's, it's a key component to it. Um, you know, we make sports different. Last thing I'll say is we make sports different than we make everything else in life. And it's different in a lot of different ways, but it's similar in a lot of different ways. Would you want to hire somebody if people who run companies there or people working in companies, would you want to hire somebody and pay them $5 million, $10 million, $20 million, $30 million guaranteed and not have any idea how they thought, how they processed, if they were going to sacrifice if they were a good teammate, teammates just aren't in sports. Teammates are in everybody's work, walk of life. And so you know, it just makes sense to try and do it. And sometimes an agent will keep you away from doing it. And in my book, that's, red that's flag. a little bit of a red flag. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Ned, just as a, kind of a follow-up to that question for us fans and everybody who's watching us right now, give us a little bit of what it's like to – you want to make a trade or you 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 want a player or somebody calls you you know you get a call from Brian Cashman and says hey Ned uh, we're interested in uh, you know so and so or you make the call and say how does that process work and 
I mean, you get calls like, Hey, we, we want Barry, but yeah, well, we, you want Barry, you can have, uh, we want your entire organization. I mean, where, where, where do you do, how does the process work? Cause obviously somebody has got to make the first call, right? Well, you, you establish relationship with every GM and you know, there's some that you're just not going to get along with personality conflict, um, whatever, but you know, you still have to have somebody in your organization that can talk to somebody in their organization. You know, there was probably three or four that every GM has a tough time dealing with. Some GMs are always trying to win every deal. So, you know, that that's upside down because not everybody, you know, you can't, you can't go into a deal trying to win the deal. You, you can't necessarily worry about how the other team is going to maybe get better because of the players trading. If you have a chance to win and you have a chance to get the player you want, you're going to have to pay for it. So, but you stay in touch so that there's not, like you haven't talked to somebody in a year and now suddenly you're you're calling them about, you know, their catcher, you know, it's like, Oh, wait a minute. You know, how desperate is this? I haven't talked to this person in a year. So you constantly stay in touch and you constantly stay in the communication and you just say, you know, and you got to understand again, you scout everybody. There were some GMs in my era that, you know, you could call and you could just be us with and, and have a good time with, and then drop something on them. And say, hey, would you think about doing this? Say, yeah, yeah, I'll do. Yeah, I'll think about that. You know, and and that's how it goes. And then you you continue to have conversation. And some guys that that are not that easy going or that easy to talk to, or you you've had some type of you haven't have a, a, a relationship that is built as strongly as those. You still have to call around, and you still have to plant the seed at least, because you don't want to find out somebody you have interest in does get traded, and you've never done anything about it. That's like oh, shoot. He was available. Wanna, yeah. 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 Do you want to? Would you rather do these canvassing calls in the off season? Would you rather do them? Would you rather do a call? Or would you rather be sitting face to face in the winter meetings? Oh, you'd, always rather, you'd always rather be sitting face to face. Oh. Really? Because I would think yeah. maybe you might give away. You might, you know, your face may give away your yeah. your you know name comes up that you're excited about. I guess it maybe depends give on it away. how confident you are. I would yeah. always want to. I, I you know. This face is my, my face is my face, you know, and I'm not going to give away nothing, you know, and, and, but somebody else may give away something. Is, yeah. is there I certain teams that. though that you wouldn't like, we've talked on the show recently about the giants A's looks like there's a natural fit with the A's selling everybody off, but it seems like maybe uh, uh, the A's management doesn't want to deal with the giants because they're, be. but Farhan, as Larry has said, has said he'd like to make a deal with Billy Bean, but maybe it's the ownership or something. But it just seems weird because, you know, the the Padres were able to steal, it looks like, Sean Manaya from the A's. Hardly gave up any top prospects. And here's, like, the Giants have some really top-end prospects that probably could have got more, but it's like the A's, would, would they rather, like, well – the heck we're not going to give our crosstown rivals somebody that uh, will take less of a deal. Does that happen? Well, I think it's, it's a, um, it's an opinion. And somebody on, on the Oakland team may say, Hey, we got, we got what we thought was fair value. You know, just because a publication says somebody's ranked such and such, you know, that's you know, who who knows where that's coming from and who knows what what that you know what would led to that did the scouting director and the writer have a good relationship so the scouting director built somebody up for the you know i mean the writer built somebody up for the organization i mean there those things are are fun to look at but they mean nothing to me you know that's why i had scouts that's why i looked at players that's why i went out and looked at people so you're going to it's going to be an opinion um the, you mentioned writing. Cool. Do teams do 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 but, the you know, teams make write ups? What do teams make write ups to make players look better than they are? Well, no, but there's relationships throughout in industry, and and some of the people that do rankings they get along better with some scouting directors, and you know they can move a player up for you. You know, yeah, it's, he's, it's he's kind of human nature. You know, what I mean, so that stuff is fun to read to me, but I would never. It's like the major. It's like the trade rumors site. How much of that stuff ever comes true? 
You know, I mean, it's, it's an industry. Time. It's become room. The rumor mill has literally yeah. become an industry. Uh, let, let's clean up the chat here before we say goodbye to Ned. Uh, I've got this one from Jonathan who donates a dollar ninety nine. Are you at the club? Yes, I'm at the club. I get the lights going in the background. I hope you like the lights. Uh, Jonathan says Larry Pride. I think he's talking about Pride Weekend. Uh, way to go on that. Romo two thousand and one says I uh, just became a YouTube member. So Romo, glad that you're a member, a new member. Welcome to the club there'll be exclusive content for you brian rash who's also became a new member today donates ten dollars his larry congrats on your daughter's graduating college i'm sure you're a proud papa i am uh i have a 12 year old daughter when she's in college it's going to cost a billion (laughs) dollars i'm sure you're proud uh you know what i would like to reassure you and say no that won't be the case but you know what you're probably right and uh, jonathan dollar 99 says we love you ned uh and then he also hashtag pride it's Pride weekend, which is huge in the here in the Bay Area, Absolutely. the Giants and Dodgers wearing their Pride hats to to represent the community, um, and then Chris Montgomery says Ned stories are the best. In fact, Jay says I love Ned stories. All right, I'm going to ask you the last. Hey, last Larry, question. real quick, one more yes. thing before you ask the question. Yeah, I got a private chat going here. Romo texted me. These streams with Ned are gold. The nuggets in the discussions are classic baseball talk with amazing insight. Yeah, there's no Thank doubt. You, Seriously. Seriously, Ned, you you are a fountain of information, and we're I, I consider myself very fortunate to have you on any time. Clizzard has a great one, because we can't let you out of here without this one. Ooh. Who do you got winning the cup? Who's, who's going to hoist Lord Stanley's Cup? Is it going to be Nathan McKinnon in the Avalanche, or is it going to be the Lightning and their fans who just got the fan just got knocked? Did you see the highlight of the of the New York Rangers fan in the subway who knocked out the Lightning fan with one punch? My goodness. Isn't he so, some of these hockey uh, fans take it seriously. Uh, what do you think, Ned? Lightning Rangers have the Lightning down, but they couldn't finish them and they gave him second life and now the lightning are moving on and and the mcdavid mckinnon show i mean the avalanche was too much for uh for edmonton how do you see avs lightning in the in the cup final Ooh, what a, what i see a, it as a seven game series and i think um gonna be it's it's tough to pick one they're both excellent they can really fly especially colorado but you know what i it's like starting pitching you go with a guy like Vasilevsky in goal, and they may get Braden Point back. It's probably their second best player. I got to go Lightning. But again, this is going to be an epic, I believe, an epic series. But I'm going to go with three time cha- two time champion, going to be a three time champion. Wow. You got great starting pitching. You're going to have a chance to win. You got a guy like Vasilevsky. You got a great chance to win. So who's the, the home ice in that series? Um, I don't know. I, I made that prediction based on just team. I don't know who's got home ice. I'm not sure. It's going to make Probably Tampa. Better. My guess is Tampa. So uh, since maybe we've Rock got you, that up. Yeah, since we've got you, it kind of reminded me what what Tampa did to the Rangers being down 2-0 with the Warriors and the Celtics. Warriors being down 2-1, just that championship DNA, that experience. What do you got happening in these uh, this three-game set left with Boston and the Warriors? Well, I, I root for Golden State. I root for Golden State because uh, I've, uh, I've worked for and I have a lot of respect for Peter Goober, uh, one of the owners, and also uh, Steve Kerr and, and how he goes about his business. And, and Have how, you ever met Kerr, Renan? Um, just in a, in a small group. I, I've, he is one of the people I would love to spend an hour with, just on culture and how he does what he does. I think he's phenomenal at it. And um, you know, his he, teams do grow together. They don't grow right. apart. Yes. You know, he's, a, he's, and I don't watch that much NBA, but I mean, I think he's a lot like pop in San Antonio in that they really work on, on building that cohesive unit, you know, pops dinners, the wine dinners with the entire team staying an extra night in the city and everybody goes out together. I think those things are invaluable and a little bit easier to do with a basketball roster than a baseball roster. Or a football sure. Roster. But I think it's invaluable. And I, I just have so much respect for, for Peter Goober, who I've known a long time now, and, and, uh, and Kurt Well. I think that uh, you got to root for guys like that. No question. All right. We're, uh, Danny nominated tonight, and we, we didn't let Ryan get in. So, Ryan, let's finish with you. Why don't you finish if you got one comment or, or one angle, one thing you want to throw Ned's way? Danny, I'll mute Danny. Here, I'll say, where's, where's Danny? I, I muted my. No, I just muted you. I'm not trusting you to mute yourself. 
<laughs> no, I'm just joking, Dan. You, we love you, brother. We'll un- unmute Danny as long as he just shuts up. But, uh, Ryan, uh, go ahead. Fire away the last question of the live stream for Ned. Okay, so I really wanted – I've wanted this question answered for a while now, so it's not baseball-related. How do you fix your air conditioning? <laughs> oh, exactly. Exactly. Uh, uh, how, no, do you, gonna, how do you get rid of sunburn just on the nose? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah, oh, not just on the nose. Uh, oh, I think bad. That's going to be a rough sleep. Be careful, uh, Paul. Be careful. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I thought I was too tough for the sun, but turns out nobody's too tough for the sun. Anyway, uh, so I don't know how much contact you have with Goober um, still, but I just always wondered because, like, I remember when they that ownership group first bought the team, it was a lot of Goober. It was like Goober and, and Lake Hope were talked about kind of in the same breath. Is he kind of more of a low key, like he's cool being behind the scenes guy? Because somehow this is now turned into a team that is, as far as the media goes, it is owned solely by Joe Lacob. Uh, and I was I wondered, how, you know, if he's just more comfortable in that role or if, uh, you know, or it doesn't matter to him. You think probably- I don't think it matters to him. I mean, he's been ultra successful in his career. I mean, like wildly successful in his career and in his sports career, too. Yeah. You know, he's, um, you know, he had a lot of minor league franchises for a while, and then then the Warriors and the Dodgers, a piece of both, and uh, you know other teams that he's that he's got a piece of. You know, so um, I, I like how he thinks. You know, we've had conversations on culture. I was out at his house one day just to talk about culture and talk about building something that's sustainable. And uh, you know, he's seen it in a few different walks of his career. Um, just just an impressive guy, and a, and a you know always. And I, and I find this to be one of the great traits of leadership and of, of success. The word is curiosity. Mm-hmm. Few people in any of the ownership, I mean, Peter and Larry always, you know, always were curious, uh, you know, in a good, in a great way. Um, my cub ownership and some other ownerships, you know, they, they don't necessarily have, they have curiosity, but they don't have like curiosity that is, way way up there and i i can't think of a time when i was in peter's company even passing him in the hallway or you know something that you didn't plan on seeing each other where he didn't say i gotta talk to you i gotta ask you something and so i think the curiosity helps helps you learn and that told me that his his eagerness to learn even at this stage of his career still burns and I think that's that's an awesome, awesome trait to have. Curiosity. Curiosity is very, very good for getting better at what you do. All right, buddy, we're going to let you go. But I, I do have to get your thoughts on our new sponsor. So I'm going to run. I'm going to run the commercial. <laughs> We've got a phenomenal video on the back end of the commercial. I want your comments as soon as this com- as soon as the commercial comes to right. a cl- close. Here right. we go. Here's the first commercial. There'd be two commercials on the back end of the second commercial. We want your thoughts on Pasquale. Here we go. Larry Kruger here for Telmetrics. Thanks to Casey Bateman and the good people at Telmetrics. If you're an occupational therapist, if you're an orthopedic surgeon, a chiropractor, a physical therapist of any kind, uh, Telmetrics is designed for you to use in your practice and will greatly pen- benefit your patients. Telmetrics uses computer vision and artificial intelligence and provides a platform for outpatient rehab therapy services, both in the clinical and the telehealth environments. So using Telmetrics can improve your patient's experience and much more. So for all your sports injury needs, or if you're a physical rehabilitation specialist of any kind, call and make sure you use Telmetrics.co, T-E-L-M-E-T-R-I-X.co. And thanks to Casey Bateman and all the good people at Telmetrics for being a proud sponsor of the crew. I'd like to thank our sponsor, Dan Coach Emilio. Dan is a buddy, and he is a phenomenal retirement planning specialist. And you can contact him today at securemoney.com or it is number 925 628 9966. There's a lot of uncertainty in our world right now, and you want to make sure that your money is secure. That is the key. Danny's got 25 years of experience, born and raised right here in the Bay Area, and he can help you get an immediate 10% premium bonus on your principal retirement account. So give him a call, 925 628 9966. He'll make an appointment with you, and you can sit down. It's not a one size fits all kind of a
of a deal. He'll consult with you and come up with a strategy to get you going to where you want to be. Once again, 925-628-9966, securemoney.com on the web. And thanks to Dan Coach Emilio and all the people at Secure Money for being proud sponsors of The Krug Show. And thanks to Tony Casera and the good people at Casera's Italian Menswear. They are housing the Krug Show t-shirts, and they're a proud sponsor of the show as well. The Krug Show t-shirt, the Krug Show podcast t-shirt is available there at their store in Dublin. Their address is 7372 San Ramon Road in Dublin, California. And go see Tony Casera and get yourself a Krug Show t-shirt and support the show. And special thanks to our sponsor, New York Style Italian Sausage. That's right, NewYorkStyleSausage.com is their website. Phenomenal product, whether it's the breakfast sausage, the Italian mild, the Italian spicy, the chorizo. You cannot go wrong with New York Style Italian Sausage. Once again, NewYorkStyleSausage.com, often imitated, never equaled. And they are a proud sponsor of the Krug Show. Thanks to them as well. And it wouldn't be a complete show unless we heard from Pasquale from the New York style Italian sausage company. We grew up with a Sunday dinner. That means no matter how busy you were, no matter where the hell you were, you came to dinner on a Sunday night. Yeah, Sunday dinner without sausage. It's like a church without God. You know, how can you go to church if you don't believe in God? You know, and along with the sausage also became the discussions, that was discussion night. You know, it, it wasn't a typical family that you sit there and you're quiet, you know, and you don't talk with a mouthful. Oh no, man. Italians talk when they're eating. Italians even talk when they're sleeping. And definitely we talk with our hands. So if we can't express it through our mouth, through our lips, we express it with our hands. So, uh, and that's what sausage is, really. It's an expression, you know, that life is good. There you go. Life is good. Pasquale and everybody in the chat. Uh, Pasquale, a lot of love for Pasquale. Uh, New York style Italian sausage. What did you think of the video, uh, Ned? Classic. <laughs> Absolute classic. Yep. <laughs> One of my Italian brothers right there. That that was good. I wish I would have known him when I was living there. Yeah, seriously. Uh, also, somebody said, we love Larry and Ryan, and then said, hey, don't forget about Danny. Uh, Todd Case's Monster Slam. Shout out Dan for giving his tickets away on Wednesday night. Um, Romo 2001, Pasquale never gets old. Uh, why do I feel I'm about to be whacked? Uh, <laughs> LOL, Brian. And then Holden says he's got the super sticker. I'm gonna have to have I'm gonna have to have Ryan and the boys. Know, speaking of curiosity, I was like, I should probably figure that one out. <laughs> yeah, uh, Holden, I'm glad you have the super sticker. I'm not exactly sure what that means, but you know what? We will we will iron that out. Ned, uh, great stuff as usual. Have a great rest of your weekend. We love picking your brain on on baseball, and uh, hopefully we'll we'll pick a time next week. We'll get you back and talk more ball. Uh, have a great rest of your weekend. Thanks for stopping by on the Krug Show tonight. Always a pleasure, gentlemen. Love it. I'll see you next time. Look forward to it. Thanks, Ned. Sounds good. The great Ned Coletti in the house. Uh, (laughs) uh, Guys, we'll finish up right here. I don't know if you have any any final comment on the uh, live stream here as we we wrap it up. But, uh, yeah, people uh, saying – Oh, I should say uh, this one. Jonathan donated $1.99. Love you, Larry and Ryan. And then – if you go further down the chat, people are like, hey, wait a second. Jonathan, you forgot Dan. Love you, Dan. So, right. you know, what can Thanks. we say? Uh, Danny? Your, your tickets, Mark, will be in the mail. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, wait a second. One more here, Jonathan. Another dollar nine in there. Where's my love, Larry and Ryan? Uh, hashtag pride. There you go. And Todd K says, hit the like button, everybody. Yeah, if you can hit the like button, if you can hit the subscribe button, if you want to be a member of, if, you know, one of the things that you've been seeing the last couple of days in the chat are people like Romo 2001, who are now highlighted in green. And it says Romo 2001 became a YouTube member. So we're going to produce some content that will be strictly for members and members only. So if you want to get a hold of that content and be a a, uh, a member of the Krug Show, uh, you can just click join, I believe. I think you click join 
right, Rye? And then that alone makes you, I think it's the price of, basically it's a monthly price for like what it would cost for like a cup of coffee to be a member. So it's hardly uh, super expensive, but uh, we will put out some content just for members. Um, and we appreciate everybody who joins as a member. So uh, we appreciate that. You guys got a final thought. And by the way, thanks to Brian Rosh, who joined earlier today as a member. He said, Dan and Ryan are the best. Um, and there's no question. Uh, Todd said, Dan's a given. Dan's a given. Uh, and then uh, somebody said, wait, wait. Somebody, where would he, where is this one? Mark Gray says, I'm in Arizona, Dan. Awesome. So there you awesome. go. Awesome. We, we got to get to meet up here. I'm, I'm down here in Arizona where it's, uh, as you know, it was 113 today. Romo 2001 says, hit the like button for Pasquale, for my Pasquale. There you go. There we go. Um, great stuff today, guys. And, you know, we're going brief because I am getting up at four o'clock in the morning. And but seriously, guys, great week. This has been a hell of a week. Great. We really did have some phenomenal stuff. Last night's postgame show where Rye started sober, finished not as sober was, I thought, one of the one of the more fun shows of the year that we've done so far. And Ranger 44 just became a YouTube member. So Ranger 44. All right, bro. We appreciate that. We're glad that you're a YouTube member member and if anybody wants to be a member just click the join button on the uh, screen that you'll see when you're on youtube and it's real easy to join and you'll get some exclusive content in the days and weeks ahead uh, but guys give us a final thought kind of giants, like giants going for the sweep tomorrow and the warriors are going for uh the three two lead tomorrow yeah uh, no, we're gonna have a monday, we're gonna, monday. Or monday i should say yeah. i will be off tomorrow because of my daughter's graduation celebrating that but we'll be back on monday for a combo I don't know if the Giants do the Giants go Monday. Yeah, they do. Yeah, they go right? Monday night. Monday against night, Kansas City. Kansas City. Yep, Six forty-five. Yeah. Ryan, yeah. Did we do a. Maybe we should do a show of the Giants sweep tomorrow. Yeah, I, yeah. I think that's. If, a good if we deal. get a sweep, we got to come on, right? Yeah, some broomsticks. Yeah. Be- <laughs> there you go. Oh yeah. I mean, my final thought is just like, you know, uh, just think about where we were after that Celtics loss, and it was looking like we were. You know, how are we, are we, should we start selling stuff off? All of a sudden, we're three and a half back, or is it three? Four and a half. Four and a half back. Reasonable. Pretty reasonable. You know, we get we win tomorrow. We're three and a half back, and maybe the Padres the are now uh, tied, so we might not gain on. No, them. I thought yeah, it was six year. Ah, stupid. They're tied. Up. Yeah, the Padres have a chance if they win the second Get game of the place. double hitter to go into first. Let me see if they're ahead. Uh, they're playing the Rockies. And the second game of the double hitter, it's I want six, the sweep two, tomorrow. Six two Rockies in the seventh. That's good. So sweep, oh, oh, okay. sweep, sweep, yeah. sweep. Yeah, we want the sweep. I'll bring out the broomsticks. That would be great. That's yeah. one of, part of my final thought. And my other final thought is this: We've all heard of a Chinese proverb, right? Right. Well, here's the Italian proverb: Dinner without sausage is like a church without God. <laughs> Just awesome. Just awesome. Every No, I, I, I mean, Pasquale is just the best. The best. Dinner without and, sausage. And you know what? It's like, <laughs> New York, it's like a church without God. How can New you York style church? Italian sausage is far and away the best, by the way. It's awesome. It is a- absolutely an awesome product. I'm super proud uh, to uh, have them on the show and really excited about them being a sponsor. Guys, the great stuff. Great. You know, we went four hours last night. It was long. It was it was a hot night, too. It's hot, uh, but emotional. But, yeah, it was emotional. It was hot, um, but great stuff. And enjoy. If you guys go on tomorrow, that's fantastic. If you decide to take it off, I will catch up with you guys on Monday night for a little. Uh, there's Buster. Hey, Buster. Where's Faith? Uh, but Monday night we'll have a we'll have a phenomenal uh, combo post game. Little Giants Royals, little Warriors Celtics, and I like I like I like uh, Golden State to win Game Five. I think they, this is where Golden State takes over this series. They're going to win Game Five. And they're going to go back to Boston and they're going to finish it on the parquet. I really believe that's going to happen. So um, anyway, thanks to everybody. Uh, Romo two thousand one says the great proverb, Dan. Uh, but anyway, can we can we get one more monster slam on the way out the door and we'll call it a night. Absolutely. Let's do it. Drive to the hoop again. He kicks it out to Wiggins. Wiggins drives 
Goes in for a monster slam! Yeah, never met a man I've been scared of. Careful, you won't get exactly what you asked for. Careful, whatever you bring me, get in hand. Or I answer to no one, I don't need to hassle. Yeah. We ain't never fall back. Hold our ground where we at. Where we at.